The name California was possibly chosen from a Spanish novel in 1510 about a mythical queen named Calafia. She reigned on an island inhabited only by black women with weapons of gold, the only metal on the island. At this time, California was thought to be an island, and the few Spanish search for this mythical kingdom was to continue for many years. In 1519, Spain sent Hernando Cortes and his army to Mexico, searching for gold. After the conquest of Mexico, Cortes and other explorers looked for the mythical kingdom of Cibola, or the seven great cities of gold far in the north. Discovery of Alta California is credited to Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, who for Spain entered the San Diego Bay in 1542. This man was the first European to set foot on California soil, and California was supposed to belong to Spain thereafter. However, the noted English explorer, Sir Francis Drake, claimed California for the English in 1579. Drake landed near San Francisco Bay. He was impressed by the beauty of land and the friendly natives. Drake named California Nova Albion, or New England, and sailed for home. For 150 years, California was forgotten. Then Spanish officials in Mexico became alarmed as foreign vessels of the English, French, Dutch, and Russians threatened New Spain's frontiers with activities in the Pacific. The Spanish sent an overland party led by Don Gaspar de Portala. He laid out a presidio or fort in the north at Monterrey. The presidio was to guard against foreign settlement. Three more presidios and three pueblos, or cities, were also built in California. Colonization had begun. Father Junipero Serra was also sent to California to found a series of missions in 1760. During the next 54 years, the Franciscan Fathers established 21 missions along the El Camino Real. These adobe shrines were to become the cornerstone of a new world. Each of the missions had two to three thousand Indians. The Indians were instructed in the Catholic religion. They were taught to farm the land and herd cattle. They did the labor of the missions. Also settling California were perhaps 100 colonist families of Mexican descent who had been enticed by land offers in the Pueblos by 1799. There were also less than 35 land grants ceded to private persons in the entire Spanish period. For 50 years, the pastoral civilization in California had remained isolated from the old and new worlds, except for occasional visits of foreign vessels. In 1812, the Russians founded a colony 16 miles north of San Francisco Bay called Fort Ross. The Russians built a sturdy stockade planted orchards, grew grain, potatoes, and other crops while hunting sea otters off the California coast. Only about 100 persons lived at the fort and traded with the people of California, although formal permission was never given the Russians to settle in the country. In 1822, the Republic of Mexico had won her independence from her mother country, Spain. The Spanish colonists of California pledged their allegiance to the Republic of Mexico. The Mexican Constitution of 1824 set up a new federal form of government. By 1833, the new government of Mexico turned the California mission lands from the church to private property. The Indians were to receive part of the new lands. Most traded away or lost their land. Many Indians worked on ranches and others returned to the mountains and valleys from where they had come and by 1846, 600 private land grants were sold by the Mexican governors or given to rancheros, the first people to be called Californianos. Each ranchero must become a Mexican citizen and a Catholic. Mexican citizens were preferred to foreign settlers. The vagueness of descriptions of the grants would lead to land disputes. Land problems were ignored by the Republic of Mexico during her ownership of California from 1822 to 1848. The early 40s problems in Mexico forced the Mexican government to abandon many of its California presidios. It was clear another nation would soon be in control. 
Jedediah Strong Smith and his mountain men companions pushed across the West High Sierras in 1827. These white men were in search of beaver and other fur-bearing animals. They were followed by other Americans moving west looking for better climates and farmlands. Many settled in California. John A. Sutter landed in San Francisco in 1839. He visited Governor Juan Alvarado, Mexican governor of California, to buy rich farmlands in the Indian wilderness of Sacramento Valley. Sutter was given 55,000 acres where the American and Sacramento rivers meet in order to stop foreign settlers from moving in. Here Sutter could ship products down the river to the fine harbor in San Francisco. The valley was on one of the main trails overland from the east to the west coast. Sutter founded a fort, plowed and planted his fields, bought cattle and sheep. The Indians living nearby worked for Sutter as needed in the fields and as soldiers along with the white men. Adobe bricks for walls and buildings were drying in the sun. Slowly, walls began to rise, two feet thick and 18 feet high. Sutter brought equipment from the Russian Fort Ross as they withdrew when the sea otters were depleted in California waters. He purchased lumber, iron tools, a boat, and cannons. By 1841, the fort was completed with cannons in place. Sutter had a main building in the center of the fort, which contained his living quarters. Along the inner walls were located a tannery, quarters for soldiers, a gunsmith shop, a kitchen, equipment for farming, vaqueros quarters, Mexican cowhand quarters, and rooms for overland travelers. The first emigrants to find their way to Sutter's Fort were John C. Fremont, his guide Kit Carson, and his exploring party. Fremont would chart trails and publicize routes that attracted more overland travelers to the west. His role of explorer changed to soldier as Mexico lost her faltering grasp on California. A revolution overthrew the Mexican government. Vying for power and control were the new Mexican government, the United States, the Californians, and the Mexican settlers. President Polk offered to buy the California territory, but the new government refused. A group of revolting Yankees, mostly hunters and trappers, settled in the Sacramento Valley and seized the northernmost Mexican outpost at Sonoma on June 14, 1846, proclaiming it the California Republic. Fremont, leader for the United States, would not allow them to fly the stars and stripes. The Yankees raised this crudely made emblem on a flagpole in the plaza. The bear, strongest animal in California, stands his ground always, and as long as the stars shine, we stand for the cause. Many years later, the famous bear flag was adopted the official state emblem. The Americans at Sonoma had not heard that the United States was at war with Mexico. Sutter's Fort, the northern capital of Monterrey, Yerba Buena, or San Francisco, San Jose, and San Juan Bautista would all be in American hands by August as northern Mexican Californians favorably transferred their allegiance to the United States. Not a shot was fired. The Southern Californians had closer ties with Mexico and remained loyal to their home government. Clashes occurred with the heaviest casualties in the Battle of San Pascual Valley, San Diego. Approximately 50 Americans were killed at a surprise attack. The Americans won the Battle of California as the Coenga Capitulations were signed on January 13, 1847 at Rancho Coenga, signed by John C. Fremont and Andres Pico. It was a generous document. The war continued in Mexico with battles fought at Buena Vista, Veracruz, and Mexico City. War ended in 1848. The United States thus acquired land from Mexico by war, treaty, and purchase, paying $25 million to Mexico. Just 10 days before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed, February 1848, a trusted employee of Captain Sutter, James Marshall, found gold in Coloma. Sutter and Marshall had signed a contract for the building of a much-needed sawmill on the American River at Coloma, where lumber was in abundance water power and transportation from the river were available. 
It was in the tail race of the mill that Marshall found flecks of gold. He excitedly told his co-workers. Later, meeting with Sutter, the two men decided to keep the gold discovery secret until the mineral rights could be obtained from the Indians. However, the news quickly leaked out and Sutter wondered what would become of his kingdom in the wilderness. Sam Brannan told the world of the discovery as he published the news in the San Francisco paper which he owned, the California... By June 1848, the news of the discovery of gold in California was heard around the world. This resulted in the greatest mass migration in human history. Men from all over the world came to California seeking excitement, glory, adventure, and wealth. During the first two months, 90 ships with 40,000 people came from New York, an 8,000-mile trip either around the Cape Horn or by land across the Isthmus of Panama. It took many months either way. The harbor of San Francisco had 500 ships anchored by July 1849. All were empty as the crews went to find the pot of gold along with their passengers. From Missouri, it was 2,000 long, hard miles to California. 50,000 immigrants came overland in 1849. Covered wagons crossed the plains, mountains, and deserts. When the prospectors, some with their families, arrived, they had hardly settled in their way, new way of life before staking their claims at the mill site in Coloma. The prospectors used crude sluice boxes and pans in their search for gold. Nearly $10 million was taken from the American River in 1849. Within a year, Coloma was built up. Sutter lost his land at Coloma and his fort as no one would work while gold could be picked from the streams. Sutter's eldest son, John A. Sutter Jr., arrived from Switzerland in 1848. The elder Sutter would transfer the, his holdings to his son, who had the downtown Sacramento area surveyed, subdivided into lots, and sold them. Sacramento was soon developed into a busy city as the miners' supply center, and again the river played an important part in California history. Sacramento became capital of California in 1854. Currently, the Embarcadero, or waterfront, is being reconstructed. A party of men from a frontier post in Sacramento River area started down the foothills for Sutter's Mill. The first night out, they camped by a stream known as Auburn Ravine. Claude Channa, organizer of the party, tried the gravel for gold, and his first pan found three sizable nuggets. This was enough for the four Frenchmen and 25 Indians. They pitched their tents and started mining operations. The Auburn strike was one of the richest in the world. One miner took $16,000 from five carloads of dirt. Auburn's relic of the past includes the old Chinese house dating back to 1855. It was in this area that the worst fire broke out and most of Auburn was destroyed in one hour and 25 minutes, including the old mercantile building. Other sites include the firehouse, the site of Wells Fargo office, and Hollenbeck Bank. Here stands the first permanent post office, still in use since 1851. By the summer of 1849, gold was discovered in the area of Deer Creek Dry Diggings, now known as Nevada City. Deer Creek was one of the richest mining regions in the state. Over $378 million worth of gold was recovered from this area. Gold was not Nevada City's only claim to fame. James Ott, in 1859, in his assay office on Main Street, small building on the right, tested the ore samples that determined the fabulous Comstock silver load and started the rush to Virginia City in Nevada. George Hearst sold interest in the Lecompton mines here and joined the stampede to Washoe Territory, where he made his fortune. Many fires plagued Nevada City also. For that reason, fire stations became prominent. Stations are shown on the left. This is a typical house of those built in the early 1850s. This home, with its Victorian architecture, interior as shown in the bedroom, kitchen, was from later years. Columbia, gem of the southern mines, had $87 million of gold taken from its mines. It was first called Hildreth Diggins, for two prospectors 
who found gold in 1850. In 1852, there were over 150 places of business, mostly built of wood, including 30 saloons. Then the plague of the mining town, fires that destroyed everything. After that, buildings were built of locally produced red brick, as in this general store. Again and again, fire struck. The iron doors and window shutters would become characteristic of old mining towns designed to prevent spread of fires. The Wells Fargo and Company Express office was built after a fire in 1857. The company was the center for shipping of freight, passengers, and supplies. The huge gold scales on exhibit weighed out more than $55 million in miners' gold dust and nuggets in their time. Before railroad, the horse-drawn stagecoaches were loaded with the miners' gold in iron-bound strong boxes and carried to San Francisco with armed guards. Hold-ups were not uncommon. The doctor's office and drug stores were all busy during boom times. Hangtown now becomes known as Placerville in 1849 among the largest mining camps. First called Old Dry Diggins, Placerville was situated along the immigrant trail that led from Carson Pass to Sacramento. Floggins and hangins were a common form of justice of the time. Several hangings were conducted at this site near the center of town called Elsner Hay Yard from a large oak tree growing where this building now stands, and the town became known as Hangtown. Telegraph lines tied Placerville with San Francisco in 1853, and in 1860 came the famous Pony Express and its famous mail couriers. The express riders braved hostile weather, terrain, and Indians riding in relays from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento. The Pony Express lasted only a year and a half, but it captured the imagination of the country and pony riders became enduring heroes of the Old West. Local diggings played out in Placerville, but in 1859, with the Comstock Silver Strike, life boomed again. This time, the city became a major freight and stage stop for the thousands that migrated to and from Lake Tahoe and Virginia City, Nevada. Also, the overland stage, which climbed to 6,225 feet to Lake Tahoe and then dropped down to Virginia City, Nevada. When the Comstock Silver Lode was discovered in 1859, Virginia City, Nevada was to become the most incredible boom town in the far west. This town was to become a major supplier of money needed for the construction of San Francisco and is tied closely to the growth of California. Virginia City boasted of its fine schools and churches. Its elaborate homes included that of silver tycoon John McKay, Mark Twain worked as a reporter for this newspaper, The Territorial Enterprise. The town grew to a population approaching 25,000, with store buildings lining the main street. Along on a side street is the Miners' Union Hall, the first in Nevada. A view of Virginia City from its vast cemetery tells of Virginia City's fabulous past. With the meeting of construction crews of the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railways at Promontory Point in Utah, California's isolation ended forever. The driving of the Golden Spike marked the beginning of modern times. Another exciting era in California's history was as she became the 31st state as the 31st Congress voted her in. California's state capital was completed in 1874. Her state seal and coat of arms was adopted in 1849 with the goddess of wisdom, Minerva, the grizzly bear, strongest animal in California, the miner, and ships of exploration and commerce. The state flag was adopted in 1911, first raised at Sonoma on June 14, 1846 by a group of Americans in revolt against Mexican authority. California's state flower was adopted in 1903. The golden poppy once grew in great profusion throughout California, and the flaming glow it lent to the hills could be seen from far out at sea. Some Indians believed that the gold the white man dug from the earth 
was really layer upon layer of golden poppy petals driven deep into the soil by the rain. <laughs> 